Okay. Right. So I'm now on the agenda. Can everyone see that? Okay, right. So I won't go through the agenda. So I talked about the official starting age being three until school entry age, which is a problem because um, school entry age varies around the world from actually in some countries it's the age of four, but that's not included here in this World Bank information. <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> only 35% of, of countries, of 45 countries of which we've got 34 European countries and um, an additional 11 um, OECD countries actually begin um, pre-primary education um, sometime between the ages of three and five, okay? And as we can see, um, Hungary and Finland, there on the far on the far left, they began this year at compulsory education at the age of three. Okay, and Mexico, I don't know when Israel began, but I know that Mexico began in 2010, um, which is fantastic for a country like Mexico. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that often foreign language learning takes place um, in a situation which is not actually compulsory education, which is an interesting situation to be in um, and I think um, makes a difference to how we are approaching what we do. Um, so let's have a look at foreign language learning in Europe. Can you all see the slide there? Yeah. Um, there are only three countries that actually begin foreign language learning um, officially um, under the age of six um, and that's Cyprus and Poland which began this September and Belgium, the German part of Belgium which has been um, teaching or having, I think it's bilingual education there for quite a while. Malta, even though they begin a foreign language at the age of five, they actually start school at five, so it's not pre-primary education. Okay. Um, so officially, um, in, in the European countries, there are only three countries that actually do, um, it's part of the curriculum to begin a foreign language. Um, however, we know from a lot of anecdotal evidence that um, foreign languages are um, everywhere in, in um, pre-primary education in Europe. This is a list of some of the references that I found um, to the existence in those particular countries of widespread um, foreign language learning and in most cases that is English. Um, for example, in Portugal, the study that I did with a co colleague from AFI, uh, Sonia Ferreirinha, um, we spoke about the results at a conference in October and every single school that has a foreign language teaches English, so it's, it's, um, it's only English which is taught in Portugal as a foreign language. Um, now, ac according to um, uh, research in 2006, there are four types of, um, of language learning in um, pre-primary education. And I've put it along a, a, a continuum, really, that looks at whether it focuses on language or whether it focuses on learning through language. Um, so the instructed foreign language learning, which is often um, for small periods of time, a couple of, of sessions a week, um, where often, not always, but often a teacher will come in from outside and teach the children the English for 30, 45 minutes and then disappear off again. Um, a language awareness model, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but this tends to not so much focus on the language itself, but the idea of other languages existing and um, immersing children in different, um, different experiences related to different languages. So it might not just be um, English in this case, it could be um, French, German, Spanish. Um, <laughs> Hello. Um, CLIL is content language integrated learning um, and um, there are, there's evidence that this is happening in pre-primary as well and of course there's also evidence that um, bilingual or partial immersion um, projects are taking place throughout Europe. Okay. Um, now if we look at those models and where they fit in terms of state and private schooling and, and language schools I think it's fairly obvious that the instructed foreign language learning will take place in language schools and none of the other projects will. But um, you'll have a variety in the state and private schooling in these European countries. However, 
the majority of cases will be instructed foreign language learning. Um, and um, I'm just going to show you. Oh. Um, so, so I'll just go back again. So that means that we're looking at um, often, if you think about the continuum, we're looking at a focus on the language as opposed to a focus on learning through the language which is an issue when we're working with very small children. Okay, um, so now I'd like to look at teacher qualifications. Um, and in a European document back in 2011, some guidelines were published and um, the qualification profile of any staff that work with small children is especially important. But of course, if you're teaching English, that's just as important as well. And in fact, um, what I think is a really nice quote here from um, two researchers in the Czech Republic, where they actually felt that the younger the child starting to learn a second language, the higher the importance of teacher qualifications. And we often think, oh, they're small children, it doesn't really matter you know, how the teacher has been trained, but in actual fact, we couldn't be further from, um, from being correct there. So, what do we look at um, in terms of teacher qualifications for small children in particular? Well, of course, teachers should have a fairly good language proficiency, um, and that's debatable as well uh, around Europe, where sometimes it's B1, sometimes it's B2, um, sometimes it's C1, <laughs> but rarely. Um, but not only do they need language proficiency, but they also need to be fairly confident to be able to speak fluently and spontaneously to children. Um, in the in, in pre-primary context, this is especially important because our small children will be far more spontaneous. Um, and of course, they need the principles in, in, of pedagogy and child development, which with this age group as well, as well is extremely important. And so, what we what we have really are are, are two sort of um, two types of teacher which seem to be appearing in in, in the research. You've got your pre-primary educators, and I've deliberately used the word educator here because um, they are not teaching children, they are educating them to be um, people, um, little people, <laughs> who will eventually become big people. Um, and, and we've got the English teachers. And of course, it's this little bit in the middle, which is the perf perfect kind of teacher to be um, when you are a, a, a mixture of, or have training in both areas. You've had pre a, a training in, to be a pre-primary educator and you've had training to be an English teacher. Um, in, I just want to share a little bit of the research that, that um, we've done here in Portugal. Um, so we sent a questionnaire to um, all, all the, the um, um, pre-primary schools in mainland Portugal and we got uh, a fairly good response rate, in particular from state schools, we got nearly 80% response from state schools. Um, and um, so that's the blue in this particular graph. And as we can see, um, those responsible for teaching English, because in Portugal all schools teach English, um, we can see that we have nearly 90%, um, or just over 80% of the teachers responsible for teaching in pre-primary education are English teachers. They're not pre-primary educators. It is nice to see that there are some projects where pre-primary educators work together with foreign language teachers, but they're in a, a, a large minority there. Now, if you look, actually, this is the graph um, which relates to the teacher's qualifications. So Q is qualifications. And um, I'll, I'll get to, to your question, your, your comment in a bit, Judy. Um, we can see that there's a very small number in the state system in particular of, of um, English teachers who actually have a degree in pre-primary education, but that a huge majority have a degree in foreign languages. Which is, which is good because there are um, teachers, English teachers that actually didn't have any degrees or had degrees in other subjects, um, a real mixture, okay? Um, so, um, and, and because, because pre-primary education is not compulsory, it's actually quite difficult for rules and regulations to be set out to say who should and who shouldn't teach languages. Um, so Judy, you say when you taught pre-primary, you taught academics through the arts. Right. Okay. So um, I'm not quite sure what you mean there. So when you trained pre-primary teachers? Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll, I'll move on, okay? Okay, so um, that list that I that I showed you earlier of the countries that that, um, that, that there is research that shows that English is, is, is um, being taught in pre-primary, um, these are the teachers that are responsible for um, teaching the language. So the LT is a language teacher and pre-ed is um, the classroom educator. And as you can see, only in France and Italy do is there evidence that the pre-primary educators are actually teaching English. And in Italy uh, and France, in both countries, um, many of these educators are, have a, a language, uh, are lower than B1 in terms of language ability. So we've either got language specialists or we have um, um, pre-primary educators. And it is actually quite unusual that you have a mixture of the two. And if you want to introduce Poland and Cyprus, who have actually begun officially to, um, to um, teach um, English this September, um, in Poland it's language teachers who are going in, and in Cyprus it's pre-primary educators who are being trained up as English teachers, which is actually um, quite easy for the Cypriots because they were um, colonised um, by the, the, the Brits, quite a while ago, and many of the educators speak very good English. So, um, so it's a wonderful opportunity for those, those um, teachers or those educators to become um, um, pre-primary English teachers. Um, and in fact, they don't usually teach their own group of children. They actually move around and teach other groups of children. Okay, okay so Judy, thank you. <laughs> yes, lovely. You can do so much through art. Thank you very much for explaining. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, what I thought was to try and find out what it was that happens in your context, if you know. So either the context in which you work and train, or the context or where you live. Do you have any idea where you fit in this? Um, you know, which whether you're a language teacher that has not a lot of English a week, whether you're a, a pre-primary educator, or whether the context in which you work. Let me go to the. Um, the pod there so you can you can do the poll here we go I hope you can see it if you want to just click there I'll just put it over here okay um, if you can just click great you should be able to see F as well <laughs> lovely thank you oh there we go okay right yeah already F none of these okay <laughs> Okay, yep. Has everyone managed to do it? <laughs> Carla, are you able to do it on the poll? Can you see the poll? So I think generally we're looking at language teachers with uh, low exposure. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. We also have, okay, we also have language teachers with a little bit more. So three to five sessions a week, that's good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, so we're looking mainly here. You've got we've got ten of you. So ten out of twenty-two. So that's just under half, or none of these. Um, I'm not going to ask what none of these are, because then we'll we'll. Um, I've got quite a lot to talk about, and and um, I'm going to hide it now. Okay. Um, and we might um, spend a lot of time talking about that. But what my point, I think, is what I'm trying to make is that, well, I know I'm trying to make it, is that in the majority of cases, we're looking at foreign language teachers who are either, you know, who are being trained up or who are actually teaching in um, pre-primary education. And in many cases, they have no training to teach small children. Okay. Um, Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Okay, so often it's a foreign language teacher who literally does just parachutes into a classroom. And this seems to be what's happening in Portugal in particular. The results that we've had from the questionnaire are exactly this. 
and I've done follow up, some follow up um, interviews and observations. It's very much a case of the English teacher coming in, doing her bit normally, or sometimes his bit, and then disappearing off. Um, and this is indeed worrying because we know that um, with very small children we need to make connections and learning needs to be integrated. So if you look at the European guidelines for pre-primary language learning, um, it actually states very clearly that children should be exposed to the target language in a meaningful and, if possible, authentic setting. Um, and that they should be learning language spontaneously. Um, it shouldn't be focused on explicit language teaching. Um, so if we look at authentic settings, we need to think, therefore, what is an authentic learning setting for children? Well, the UNESCO description of approaches and methodologies to um, pre-primary education states that we should be providing children with interaction with peers and educators, uh, play-based activities, um, and learning opportunities which, which promote social interaction with peers. Okay? And that we should be helping the children to develop skills, learner autonomy, and school readiness. Okay? Um, I'm just seeing what you're writing here. Hi. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's the youngest. Thank you, Marisa. That's often the case. And I think the research, it was um, Helen Emery's research, was very clear in that, was that the younger the teacher, with, and the teacher with less experience would be the teacher who would be working with the younger age group. And now it's becoming, you know, pre-primary is the younger age group. It's not just the first grade of, pre, of primary, it's becoming pre-primary education. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to focus on is the idea of play-based activities. And we know that play is hugely important with small children. So um, that's where I'm going to move on to now. Uh, so the pedagogical implications of play in foreign language learning. Uh, in particular, play in a foreign language learning context where, where children are exposed to one or two, so a, a low exposure context, um, although it, 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 uh, three to five sessions a week is, is, um, is also very much a foreign language context, isn't it? Although um, a little bit, it facilitates learning if the children are exposed for a little bit longer. Um, Okay, so we know that effective early years education um, combines good adult practices. My cat has just decided to come in. <laughs> Let me just get her up. Put her on my knee. <laughs> okay. Um, um, it involves adult-led practices and structured child-initiated activity. So let's just have a look at what that means. Um, so child-initiated activity, child-initiated play is um, play that the children choose to do themselves um, and it's the opportunity for the children to have a go to try and um, try things out to experiment to make mistakes uh, and to learn from those mistakes okay um, and it's something which is very much part of western um, um, pre-primary education um, and it's based on um, the, the theories of um, Ovid de Crolli, who was a Belgian, and Maria Montessori, who we all know was Italian. Absolutely, Judy, play is their work. <laughs> it's very serious. <laughs> yes. Um, and Ovid de Crolli and Maria Montessori, um, towards the end of the 19th century, were working towards the same sort of thing in a way. Ovid de Crolli is the father of educational toys. So um, he began, or well, he developed toys that would help children understand specific things in terms of mathematics or, or, or size, for example, sequencing, that kind of thing. Um, and Maria Montessori um, believed very much in children um, um, living in a miniature adult's world and becoming responsible for things like putting things away when, when you know, in a little pretend house, for example. Um, and um, um, being able to uh, make beds or do the ironing, but with their pretend irons and things like that. And so the idea of um, areas sort of emerged in education, and now in, in, in um, Western educational theory, a lot of um, 
three primary um, centres um, spaces will be open plan. Um, and thank you, Opal. Yes. <laughs> and um, where um, a classroom will be divided into areas. So, for example, you might have a thematic area. And this photograph is of a group of children in, in London, and they have a hospital area. And the children are role playing all the different things that happen in the hospital. So, you can see this little girl who's been very serious about being a hospital receptionist. And you also have um, content um, areas. And you can see these children here. These are actually children in Johannesburg in South, uh, South um, Africa. And they are they're in the construction area. Um, so this, these two areas are quite typical in pre-primary education. Um, this is um, what you would see if you walked into a pre-primary uh, classroom in Portugal, um, where you would have maybe not all of these areas, but, but possibly. Um, so you'd have a construction area, a reading area, which would be like a little library, uh, a writing area, which would be where children would be able to interact with um, pencils, um, paper, um, magnetic letters, all sorts of things like that. Um, a, maybe a science area where they um, would be doing activities related to science, of course, outside. You could consider that an area. A game area with puzzles and, and board games. Uh, yes, an open plan class, Marisa. A house area is very typical where children, um, you know, there'll be like a kitchen or a living room and the children will be able to dress up and um, role play the different um, Yes, reading can be seen as play, Adrian, if you think of it as, as an activity which is selected by the children. Okay. Um, so, um, so this is very typical. Um, and of course, you will also have a, a, a circle time um, where the pre-primary educator will be, they can pretend to read, absolutely. They'll be imitating um, the whole, the act of reading. Um, and there will be a circle time area as well and possibly tables too. So those are the sort of main areas within um, a pre-primary classroom. And of course, the children would be very much in control of what they do in these areas because that's part of how they're set up because children are, um, are encouraged to be autonomous. So if they choose, and as, Paola, as Carla says here, it's their own choice what they do, um, if they choose to go into the house area, then they are responsible for um, following the rules and regulations that are part of the, the way um, pre -primary, this particular pre-primary classroom would work. Um, and so, for example, when it's time to finish, they're responsible for tidying up. Okay? They also know that maybe only two or three children can play in the area at any one time because they know that if more than eight children play in the house area, then it gets chaotic and it doesn't work. So, so um, th this is how children learn, up, gr gr uh, learn to be a autonomous um, um, responsible young things. Um, anyway, in English, of course, often what happens, especially if it's in a low exposure foreign language learning context, is that a teacher comes along, they do their little circle time activities, they might have table time, and then they go away. So, so we don't have any of this um, structured child-initiated play. It doesn't happen. And I've already explained that we need a balance of these two types of play. So, um, what we can do is we can in include in the classroom an English learning area. So it becomes part of the classroom. So when the English teacher goes away, the English area remains and it becomes part of or one of the multiple choices that the children have in which to engage in English when the English teacher isn't there. So English becomes integrated into what they do every day. So even if an English teacher only comes twice a week, in fact, English remains in the classroom and is available to the children every day and whenever they are allowed to um, engage in child-initiated play. So these are examples of um, English learning areas. This is one in Cyprus. Um, I did some training in 2008 and took the idea over and, um, and I visited last year and this was um, one of the areas. So you see it's very simple. It's often... Um, it's often a shelf or a box somewhere on a shelf. Here it's a whole shelf and the children will come to the shelf and they'll take the resources which they relate with the English lesson. So they have um, resources which they've only used in English, okay, and they stay in the classroom. So you can see English books there, you can see puppets from the English activities, uh, you can see um, flashcards, all sorts of things there, okay. This is um, an English corner, an English area, 
in Portugal. This was part of a project from last year, which I'll be talking a little bit more about. Um, so you can see it's actually a corner space which the educator set up and it has a shelf with all sorts of resources there. Um, yes, Mari, but it would work very well with any language. It doesn't have to be English. <laughs> um, and um, uh, as you can see, there are all sorts of um, boxes with different games and activities. There is a folder there where children have what they call it's a dictionary. It's an image which they have. Each child is responsible for colouring an image and it relates to either a word or a phrase that they know how to say in English and they call it their dictionary. There are books and games and things there. But this was taken in at Halloween times so at the end of October and it was the classroom educator who decorated it with some of the things that the children had done with her and in English. This is one in Italy which was lovely and this was actually a pre-primary educator who was the English teacher as well and she trained with me in 2006 in Norwich and then she went back to Italy and she set up this area which is almost I think about a quarter of the space of her classroom it was lovely and the children had to go through this arch um, of drawings that the children had done of themselves and inside there were all sorts of activities and resources which they associated with English. Okay so I'm going to share with you a little bit of research which I was involved in last year which was um, sponsored by or or funded by the British Council ELTRA project, um, so that's English language teaching research projects, and um, and it looked into English learning areas and um, whether they were actually very, actually successful um, in in helping children use English. Now I've been using English learning areas since 1999 2000, so I was fairly sure that they were. Um, a good thing, <laughs> but I've never actually done any any um, research into it. So it was really exciting to be able to observe children actually playing in English. And here you can see lots of children playing in English. There's no teacher there; they're comp they're doing it autonomously um, and um, having a lot of fun. So this is the context. Um, oh dear, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. It must have been the formatting as we moved across. Um, so it's it was in a a school which. Um, they provide English for all children from the age of four to six. Um, there was a peripatetic, so one of those parachute English teachers. However, it wasn't quite a parachute because she would collaborate with the pre primary educator and they had English for 30 minutes twice a week. Um, so, yes. So, um, and it was with a group of five to six year olds. There were 16 children in the classroom, although this works with 26 children in the classroom as well. It just happened that this one only had 16. Um, as you can see, two of the children were actually Ukrainian L1, um, and the, the English teacher um, was actually um, a non-native speaker, um, and she had been trained to be an English and French teacher for secondary school children, so from the age of 15, 16 in Portugal. Okay, but she'd had quite a lot of pre-primary and primary experience in the classroom. Okay, so this was just briefly the kind of um, the approach that we took to data collection and methodology. So we looked at so it was observation of, of the English sessions, but also of the children playing in the Ella is English learning area. And I took photographs as well. Um, and also um, after English lessons, we looked, I, I, I interviewed the English teacher. I had interviews with the pre-primary educators and I had interviews with the children as well. Collected some children's drawings. I don't have any to show you today. And uh, looked at the um, evaluation documentation from the school and there was a, a register which the children had to fill in to, when they played in the English learning area. So this is an example of the register. Um, as, and I, I think um, you can probably see it in the sense that you can see the dots and possibly that there are names down the left and at the top are the days of the week. Now this was actually something that pre-primary educator wanted the children to be able to do and that's a double entry table which is a, a, an important skill for them to be able to, to put their finger along the side and then realize that there's a matching row for them to, um, it is complicated, but at, at the age of five, this children should be able to do this and the educator wanted the children to, to perfect this particular skill. So this is why she set it up so that the children had to, when they went to play in the English learning area, they had to do a little dot along their name, which they were able to recognize and with the day of the week, which was in Portuguese, not in English. Okay. So as you can see, there are lots of coloured dots on there. So it was a, and this is a week. So the English learning area was fairly well selected. I think purple was the morning and green was the afternoon because those were the two free play 
um, moments in, in the day, okay? Um, and during the interviews with the children, um, this is just one little bit of the results, but we can see that the English learning area was as popular as the house area and the blocks and car area. And it, it's interesting that computer is, the, is one of the least popular, well, the writing area is actually, in this class, is the least popular, but the computer area was the second least popular area. But it's encouraging to see that children um, enjoyed the English learning area. Now, if you count up the number of responses there, you'll see there are more than 16, and that's because children often said two of the areas. Okay. Um, when I interviewed them, uh, in fact, it wasn't me who interviewed them, it was a puppet from Brazil who didn't speak English, and he wanted to know all about English. So um, the children were quite happy to tell him what they thought about English. And when he asked what they did in the English learning area, these were some of their responses. Hula is the puppet. Um, so as you can see, play is very much... Um, very evident there, the children played in the um, learning area um, and, and they read stories as well. Um, of course, they played with what was available for them to play with. When um, I spoke to the educator, the, the pre-primary educator, um, one of the things she said was that the children would imitate the English lessons. Um, and this had been, this was uh, anecdotal evidence, had been for many years, because I'd never been able to observe children. I would often ask the educator what, what the children were doing and many of the educators over the years and said, oh, they, they pretend to be you, Sandy. Uh, and then there's one of them who's a teacher and one of them who's, who's the student, and that's what they do. Um, and I thought this was very interesting. Um, it is actually very much what the children said as well. Here's a little boy who said, I play Boris. Um, and um, Isabel is the teacher. And Boris doesn't know how to speak English. And we play the colour game and stop, so he lists them a, a number of games that they play. But what's interesting here is that I asked, or, or the puppet asked, who Boris was, and and he said, oh, he, he's a little Russian boy who doesn't know how to speak Portuguese or English. So this little boy had actually taken on the role of a non, you no, know, a child who couldn't speak English or Portuguese, so that he could be the student in this in the in the English learning area. Um, yes, it, it is very common for children to do this, Mary. Absolutely. However, it, it, it's um, it's not something that we we um, look at often in foreign language learning. But what I think is important here is if we look back at what Vygotsky talks about when, when, he, when he describes or, or, or defines real play, he actually says that children have to create an imaginary situation. And if we look at this little boy, and he's becoming Boris, so he's creating this imaginary situation in, of a classroom with a child who doesn't know how to speak English or, or Portuguese. And he takes on the role of the child, and he can't speak English or Portuguese, and his friend takes on the role of the teacher. And then, of course, they do exactly what the rules determined for those specific roles. So the teacher teaches and the child learns. Um, and this is, this is real play. So it was exciting to see the children actually doing this in English. Um, and this is just an example. And this is in Portuguese, and she did say, so, and it actually says, do you want to be the student? You can be, because I am Anna. Anna is the English teacher. So this is a little girl who's holding a picture book, and she's pretending to tell the other little girl the story, and she is being Anna, the teacher. Um, here's another little girl who is often the teacher figure, and, and what she's doing here is she's imitating a chant, and she's put the flashcards on the floor just like the English teacher does, and she's giving the children instructions, so hat, put on your hat, and she does this. This is the motion that the children have to do, and as you can see, the other two children are both patting their hats. So she's giving them the instructions. Um, this is, in fact, the same three children a little later on um, in their playtime. So sometimes the children would spend up to 15 to 20 minutes and, and they would play a number of different games or do a number of different things in the in English learning area. Very bossy, Adrian, but some children are. <laughs> um, and as what we can see here, they've set up a game which they play with their, with their English teacher. And one little girl is turning over a card and she can't remember what the colour is. And so she says, help please, and her little friend... Um, helps her and he says purple. Now this is actually what happens in the English lessons. They are encouraged when they don't know something to ask the others to help them remember. And so what they're doing is they're imitating exactly what happens in Portugal. Um, again, there was lots of helping, which I found amazing. I wasn't expecting it. Um, so this is three children um, who played bingo eight times in about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, and so bingo is a game which they play with the English teacher and then the resources were left in the English learning area. 
and they took it in turns. So here you can see the little girl is the um, teacher calling out the words and the expressions and the little boys are playing bingo. Then they rotated and they played, I think it was eight times, yeah. And, and the boys were very confident and they would say, yes it is, no it isn't, when they had the images on the bingo cards. The little girl wasn't quite so confident and she was saying, yes it isn't, yes it isn't, until one of the little boys said, no it isn't. And she kind of realised that she was making this mistake and so she corrected herself. Um, and observing her later in lessons that followed, she was actually using no it isn't um, quite correctly in the classes too. So this is a wonderful, um, this is evidence that children are, are, um, are scaffolding each other and helping each other to, to learn English. Uh, not only did they play together, but they also played, yes they do love being teacher, <laughs> they also played by themselves and here's a little girl with an English book and she's telling herself the book and, he, and it's a little book, it's a book about a fish looking for his friends and so she's counting on her fingers and she was counting in English. Um, and then children also invented games, they did things which they had never done in English but they used the resources from English to invent these games and they spoke English while they did it. So that was interesting as well, I didn't think that would ever happen really. Um, so just summarising that, um, we can see that children played frequently in the English learning area which was brilliant. Yes, I have that book. <laughs> I have that book, Adrienne, it's a very good book. Um, children use the resources from English in their play and they use interaction. They use English in their interactions with other children. So that's very exciting news. Um, and um, and many people, many many teachers don't believe it's possible with only an hour of English a week, but you know it is. Um, so what happens is it's the resources which stimulate the children's memories of what they experienced during teacher-led sessions in English, and um, so they they repeat familiar sequences, they reenact teacher-led activities, and we saw evidence of that. They take on the roles teacher-pupil and they correct and help each other. And they also use English during imaginative play. Yes, Judy, they're learning to think in English, absolutely, and they're doing that very naturally because they're doing it through play, yeah. So what happens is that, you know, exactly what they do in English is, is the resources they use in English are either the exact resource or a replica of that resource. So here is a board game which the children play at the end of a unit of, of work, so after eight lessons um, around a topic, um, children will play a board game, for example, which will bring in all of the language and a little bit more, and they play in teams, and um, they use English with the English teacher. And then a replica of the board game from each topic moves into the learning area, and the children will have access to that board game. So here we have uh, two separate groups here of children. Um, yeah, absolutely, Mari. Yeah, what they're doing is that they are experimenting with what they know and it reinforcing, you know, um, and gaining in confidence, um, not only by themselves but with the support of others. Um, so the, there are, here are these children who are using the similar resources in in um, in the English learning area. <clears throat> so what do you think the implications are for um, English teachers or projects in pre-primary? to organise, to set up uh, an English learning area. Any thoughts? <laughs> routine. Um, do you mean the routine in the sense that um, that play needs to be part of their routine during the day, Claudia, because that's definitely the case, yes. It, if play is not, if free play or child-initiated play is not part of the children's, um, of what the children do with the pre-primary educator, then this, this won't work, yeah. Carla, teacher's level of English, so the English teacher's level of English, yeah, yes, that's very important. Um, the educator's level of English, now that's an interesting comment because over the years I've worked with, with um, pre-primary educators who've had no English whatsoever, but they've still been able to set up the learning area, the English learning area, and the children still play in English. Um, 
because the pre-primary educator doesn't actually interact with the children. She can if she feels that she wants to, and those who speak English do. But those who don't, their role is to facilitate access to and to, and to enable the space to function. So they don't actually need to speak in English. Okay. Um, Nelly, no need for private teachers after school in later years. <laughs> Yes, this, it depends on continuation because if they have this in pre-primary and then move into primary that has nothing at all, then they may still need um, tutors. So, yes, that's right, absolutely. And the same thing would happen, Mari, with the foreign language. Yeah, whether it's English or whatever language you have in your context. Yep. So they could role play. I didn't actually ever see the children role playing, but I was told that they do a lot of role playing because we leave we leave the clothes in there for them to role play, and we leave flashcards, or um, not flashcards, story cards and um, puppets, and the children do role play the stories. <laughs> okay, um, so let's just have a look at some of the implications. In fact, um, one of the implications um, is that. A teacher needs to take on the role of mediator and planner. So mediator in terms of being involved in playing with the children in English during the English lessons, but also planner in the sense that they need to plan that the resources are available to the children in the English learning area and, and plan for the children to access that those resources. So this means that the English learning area is only possible if the English teacher and the pre-primary educator actually collaborate with each other and work together. Um, yes, Mari, the story sacks would be lovely to go into the, the learning area, definitely. That's a nice, that's a nice, um, nice thing to say, Judy, opening the doors for the children. So the English teacher, so to set up the learning area, the English teacher is, put, in our case anyway, is responsible for the resources, and I think that that needs to be the case, whereas the pre-primary educator is responsible for managing the space and managing the children's time to use the space. Okay, um, Because the English teacher isn't there, so, so she can't do that. And of course, um, the pre-primary educator also has to maintain... I think if, if you're commenting on that, Nelly, is, is she wants to encourage them to use it. Absolutely. It's, and if she is interested in the English learning area and she wants it to work, then of course the children will use it as well. Um, now, if you work in a language school, um, it's still possible because in a language school, children come from different schools um, and there's no one through primary educators. But if you work in a language school, it's still possible to set up English learning areas. If you have a lesson which is slightly longer than 40 minutes, maybe 50 minutes or an hour, um, try and incorporate 10 or 10 minutes after maybe table time where children access different resources. Maybe you have an, um, an interactive whiteboard with some activities on there. Maybe you have story cards. Maybe you have some flashcards with a particular game. Maybe there's the puppet. There's some role playing um, activities. Um, so set these up in different spaces in the classroom and the children can access these resources and engage with them as they wish. The importance is that they have choice. They decide they want what they want to play with um, and it's not um, forced upon them. So I've got a couple of questions. Let me just try and catch these questions. Uh, Pre primary teachers present for the language. Absolutely, Mari. Yes, that's really important. So that collaboration between English teacher and pre-primary educator is very much a case of them being in the classroom together when the children have English. Um, and that the pre-primary educator is familiar with and interested, shows an interest in the children's learning. Uh, over the years, I've worked with many, many, many pre-primary educators and those that could not give a damn about English. And it does happen that the children's attitude is completely different to that of the children whose educator is really, really interested. Adrian, you're wondering about the ideal number ratio of children to teachers' support. Uh, that depends. If you look at, there's a recent um, report, a Eurodice report, report came out a couple of weeks ago, and um, it, that varies over around Europe. Um, it's normally 1 to 10 for pre-primary, but it, it, it's lower in some countries and higher in others, but that's about the average. 
So in Portugal, you have, um, in this case, it was 16 children to two adults, um, but, but it can be 26 children to two adults. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so if, if they are to ensure that the English areas areas building on reinforcing the language learning, yes, absolutely. Although, um, if, if the resources are the same as what's been, been in, uh, the if the resources replicate the English lesson resources, the children will imitate um, or, or be creative and they'll still use English. At least this is what, this is what the, the, the observations have shown us. Okay. Um, have I got any more questions there? Um, just a minute, let me just go back. So, uh, Marisa, you say, perhaps not present formally, but input model language needed for an activity we've done in English. Yes, and I've actually cut, uh, I didn't include this, but I've done, I'm very interested in the idea of Bruner's format and how, um, because we know that children interaction with uh, an adult um, supports language development for small children learning their L1. It's actually the same with things like routines and setting up of games as well. And so if a teacher is aware of being consistent co and coherent within you know, the kind of language she uses for different games and activities, that they are fairly repetitive, children will pick up you know, these games and activities and will be able to replicate them in the English learning area. Okay. Right, so the implications are that um, the resources need to replicate in the English learning area, need to replicate what's happened in the English lesson. They, they should be fairly um, attractive and, and they should be lasting. So I've seen many teachers just use pieces of paper to, for different activities. And of course that won't work in an English learning area because the ch there'll be lots of children there and they'll just get ripped and scrumpled up. So, you know, proper flashcards, proper cards, that are covered in or, or laminated or with sticky back plastic or in those little transparent folders or whatever, but they need to be lasting. So they can be bought. Uh, you can get them freebies from teachers, from um, publishers, or they can be made. And the children themselves really enjoy um, coloring in or, or um, making images, making games. So um, it doesn't have to be always the English teacher um, providing the um, resources. Um, oh my goodness, I've missed a lot of this discussion because my cursor was high up. So, um, I'm looking at Marisa's question here who says, did the English teacher do a language analysis before writing material or including um, activities or was it all done ad hoc intuitively? So, Did the English teacher do a language analysis? What the English teacher did was she collaborated very carefully with the educator who was working in a particular theme, so the English teacher followed through with this, a similar theme, so used similar words and expressions that the children would be looking at in their in, in Portuguese. So there was a connection there as well. Okay, um, and so the children would be playing with words and expressions together to in English. Okay, um, Charles, what about intelligible pronunciation? Um, well, children will imitate what they hear, and the English teacher is not is a non-native speaker, so they will they will speak like she speaks. Um, but there aren't enough native teachers, native speaker teachers around, and this teacher doesn't have a terrible accent because she doesn't have a, a super 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 English accent, but um, but she speaks English well. So, uh, Nelly, you, you're thinking about how it would be to have children help prepare things. Well, of course, that would be with the Prince Primary Educator as well. So it would be something they would do together. And they love playing with the things which they've made. So it's a really nice thing for them to do. Um, okay, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> what about computer video games? Well, they could have those in English as well, Nelly. But um, in this particular school, we don't use video in the classroom because there is none. So we don't have any technology in this particular classroom to use in English. So, so um, we could prepare some some things for them to do in English on on the computer because they have access to the computer. But we've decided to just focus on the activities that they do in English and replicate those resources in the in the in the learning area. And they they have a computer, but they do Portuguese things on it. Okay. 
Right. Can I just move on and just try and get over to the implications? So um, another important thing is that that we need to, to rotate um, the the resources. Um, so when new um, topics are, uh, are brought in, then those that material goes into the learning area, and some of the old stuff comes out. But then it can also go back again, okay? Because some children have favourite topics and they really enjoy um, playing with particular sets of things, okay? Um, Right. I wonder, do you want me to keep on talking or do you want to have a discussion on the chat list? <laughs> I'm not sure what to do because I can't follow everything there. <laughs> um, the idea of the space, um, as you saw a photograph of a corner, you saw a photograph of a shelf. Um, and um, there are some teachers that go, oh no, there's no space in my classroom for another corner, for another shelf. So it could go into a box or several boxes. And the box, the children can go to the box, either take things out or take the box and put it on the table and play with the resources. Okay. Um, and of course, I mean, if we brought this up earlier, but if children don't, um, if children, if, if, if a particular school or a particular approach doesn't value play, then, then this won't work because the approach to education in a particular context needs to value play for this to, to work. Um, and of course, different types of play as well. Um, and we saw examples of solitary play, cooperative play, and when they were being created there with a, with a game, symbolic play too. Okay. <laughs> you can multitask, okay. <laughs> okay. And I think that something which can also happen, and we were encouraging the pre-primary educators to do this, was but looking at using the moments in which the children play to... Um, for assessment in the sense that we can take notes, we can take photographs, those can go into portfolios, it's evidence that children are playing um, and um, it, it, you know it's something which they actually do um, and if we hear what they say we could possibly write what they said at a particular time um, and we can also, so we can use it to look at progression and assess the or, or provide evidence for the children's, um, for how children are doing but we can also use it to plan so if children are particularly interested in one particular topic or one particular kind of activity, we can use that, feed that back into our English classes and ensure that we provide lots of opportunities for that particular topic or a particular activity. Okay. So um, to, to summarise really, um, I think it's really important that we consider this idea of um, play occurring not just with the teacher, not just teacher-led play, but enabling child-initiated play, which is something that many foreign language teachers, English foreign language teachers in particular, have no idea about. And of course it, in, it implies um, collaboration um, and working together with the educator. But it's the only way to create a rich learning environment that the children can learn um, with and through English. <laughs>